And I want to share some things now about Christmas. You know, we might as well jump right in. Because what this Christmas is, is the most revolutionary thought in all of human history. It's something that turns everything upside down. And I read something in, uh, in the paper. It was, uh, it was the Gospel According to Will Smith. Have you ever noticed some of the, some of the actors you know, that are out there and some of the people in the arts truly are spiritual masters who have taken form in order to, 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 uh, to teach us through, it, through, through their different teachings. And uh, this is a wonderful way in which he takes this, this Christmas teaching and breaks it down for us. But beforehand, I'm going to paraphrase what he's going to say from the, gospel, from the uh, writings of the Apostle Paul. Paul said, in my opinion, whatever we're going to have to go through now is less than nothing compared to the magnificence that awaits us. All of creation is eagerly standing on tiptoe to see the wonderful sight of God's sons and daughters being revealed as they truly are, free from the binding chains of decay and sharing in the magnificent liberty of being God's children. Or, in the words of Will Smith, this is the cleansing, this is what happens, this is the natural reaction to the amount of light that is coming into the world. As a cleansing, this is the darkness before the dawn. I feel very, very strongly that we are shifting into what is the next age of humanity and what it's going to be right now. It just has to get stirred up in a way and we're seeing it all. It's going to be really interesting to see how humanity reacts to it. It's going to be a mess, but it's the mess in the cleanup. It's the mess and it's the purge before that new real light shows up. So it makes sense of what's going on in your life personally. It makes sense of what's going on in the world. And it's about what this revolutionary thought of Christmas is all about. And I'm going to share in my talk the most revolutionary document in history, the Magnificat. It really is about the willingness to let go of the lesser for the greater. As Jane Elizabeth Hart calls it, giving up your little fingernail for the whole universe. Being willing to let go of your limitations for something greater. This is a celebration of, yes, the birth of the Christ in the baby Jesus, but also, and most importantly, the Christ in each one of us. And I read just this week in the writings of Eric Butterworth, the Gospel according to Eric, and in his writings, he really talks about and depicts this, this Christ birth for the individual more clearly than I've seen anywhere else. And I don't usually read long quotes, but I will today, because I just want you to get a sense of this. So maybe close your eyes and listen to it. And he writes, If Jesus' concept of the divinity of humankind could clearly be understood and widely disseminated, his teaching would sweep the world and create a great spiritual revolution. He taught, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. We hunger for freedom, from want, from sickness, from oppression, most of all from our own fears. Now the religion about Jesus has failed to open up the way to this freedom, but in the simple and dynamic teachings of Jesus, we have a message that is both universal and practical, containing the keys to the kingdom of prosperity and peace and health and freedom. Now we can see that the heart and core of Jesus' teachings are concerned not just with his divinity, but with the divinity of all of us. His ministry was devoted to teaching the universality of the principle and to help people rise from their so-called sins to self-mastery. He said, nothing will be impossible to you, nothing. We need to get this idea into our consciousness, that we are made in the image and likeness of God, and that is no mere figure of speech. It is a practical fact, a dynamic truth. And when the people sought to stone Jesus for saying that God was his father, he replied by quoting the Psalms, I am telling you, I have said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. And he added, this scripture cannot be broken, saying in effect, I am only saying of myself what your own law is telling you. Don't, I don't set myself forth as an exception 
but as an example of what your nature truly is. This is our nature that is being born in each one of us. It's born in the manger 2,000 years ago, and right now in the manger of our hearts is being born. There's something that wants to be born in you, that wants to find its birth in you. And what is that something? It's, it's a universal desire that is held by all of creation to grow, to be, to learn, to expand, to evolve. It's that which wants to be born in you. Paul wrote about it. He said, from the beginning of time, all the life of creation has been groaning in the pangs of childbirth. There is that, and there's something in this, this quote that, that, that tells us that it's not something that's necessarily easy, but it's something that has incredible promise. In Revelations it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The old ones had disappeared. The world of the past is gone. This is that new transformation, what Paul called be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The, what he called let that mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. He, he also said something that's really odd when you realize his time and his place, but he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but the word wasn't strengthens, it was in Greek, it was in dunamunti, which is in dynamites me, that blows me up from inside. But in Elizabethan England, they didn't know really how to do this in dunamunti thing, so they called it strengthens, but it's really that expands me, blows me up. It's the big bang, it is that tremendous birth that Christ inside of you and inside of me. But then you say, what's the purpose of Jesus? And we can look at the teachings of Jesus and see why. Jesus sometimes spoke from the human angle, and sometimes he spoke from the divine angle. Sometimes he talked about being, I mean, he'd get annoyed about things. He'd talk about, you know, how long must this generation vex me, things like that. That was the human Jesus, and he was fully human. But there was that other aspect of him that was like a clear and perfect lens through which the light could pour and shine so perfectly that he was the perfect expression of that light so that when we looked at him and when he spoke, he was speaking from that I am, that I am self that is there in potential in each one of us but fully expressed through him. And so sometimes he spoke from one standpoint and sometimes from the other. So if there's any confusion, we can blame him, right? <laughs> but the truth is that, that there is that which wants to be born in you and in me, just as it was being born through Mary. Mary. You know, you've, you've heard the Magnificat. There have been many different versions uh, of this poem set to music. They call it that when it's set to music, but it's that wonderful poem prayer that she said to her cousin Elizabeth when she ran away. Mary was 13, 14, 15 years old, according to scholars, and she was uh, falsely accused of adultery because, I mean, after all, here she is, she's pregnant, Joseph didn't know her, and he's ready to divorce her, and she runs away to her family, to her, to her extended family, and she, she sees her cousin, her cousin Elizabeth. Now, how about you? Have you ever been gossiped about? Have anybody ever said something that wasn't true about you? How does that feel? Kabir, the great Muslim poet, said, when somebody uh, slanders you, you should hold them close to your heart and build a hut in your courtyard for them because they are cleansing your soul without soap and water. They're scouring your ego. And so, for her, this was a great cleansing experience. And she had a choice between making this, this a stumbling block or whether she wanted to use it as a stepping stone, whether she was going to use it to create a wall or whether she was going to use it as an opportunity. She is calling us through her experience here to look at the circumstances and what we call limitations of our lives like what she was going through and ask ourselves, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to face it? What are we going to make out of it? Well, she made the holy birth out of it. What are we going to do about it? This is what happened. She, she shows up on Elizabeth's doorstep, and Elizabeth is also carrying a child. And Elizabeth said, Did you see how my baby jumped for joy at the sound of your voice? Joyful is any woman who trusts in God. And Mary replied, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices because of God, my Savior. 
he has smiled upon the humble estate of his maidservant. For behold, from now on, all generations will declare me blessed, because the Almighty has done great things for me. His name is holy, and his mercy extends to all who fear him from generation to generation. Fear was understood as being in awe and respect, not being scared of. Now, at this point, everything sounds very churchy and religious, and we think of Mary as a sweet, sweet girl, and she's, she's so innocent, and now the fire comes out of her. The next part, the next paragraph has been banned by many countries. Tsarist Russia banned its being uh, taught in the Russian Orthodox Church services. Uh, the British banned it from being given in the Anglican service, uh, services in India during the colonial days because it was so revolutionary. Some people call it the most revolutionary document in history, more revolutionary than the one penned by Thomas Jefferson. It also was uh, illegal in Guatemala just 20 years ago when they had a military dictatorship and they wouldn't allow the Catholic priests to teach this. And also during the time of the disappearances of the students uh, by the fascist dictatorship in, in, uh, in Argentina about 40 years ago, the mothers of the disappeared students would protest, but they outlawed protests and these women would be carried away. So they had an idea. They thought nobody could carry us away for holding up placards of biblical texts. So they walked around carrying these phrases and these verses until they were also banned from, from quoting this. So that is the revolution, Tracy Chapman called it the revolution that sounds like a whisper. It's that revolution of consciousness that is showing up not as a political event, but as a spiritual, in, internal experience for each one of us. It's not a societal thing, although it will result in changes in the outer world. God has displayed might with his arm, has scattered those who are arrogant in the thoughts of their hearts, has brought down the kings from their thrones and exalted the humble, has filled the hungry with good things, but the rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, his descendants, for all time. This was a promise it also sounded like something that was very troubling. But it's any time you make a change in your life and you make a commitment to truly making a change in your life, it's troubling. Not just to the powers that be, but the powers that be in here. The Herod, the kings inside of you. What is that arrogant authority in you and me? It's that part of us that doesn't want to really look at this stuff. Doesn't really, you know, we're complacent. We want to keep the status quo, don't we? There's two kinds of ministries I was taught in ministerial school. There's the prophetic and the priestly. The prophetic ministry is this challenging ministry that challenges us to grow. And the priestly, which was not invalidated, but it has a place, is that which keeps us in our comfortable rituals, in our comfortable forms. But there's, there's something that's written in, in the Talmud, the sacred Jewish writings of the Pharisaical school, it says that uh, any rabbi whose congregation doesn't want to drive him out of town is a failed rabbi. It also, uh, in, in the writings of the Hasidic scholars, says when the Messiah comes, everybody will get so mad that they'll want to break his windows. There's, now, you, now there's a serious feeling in this room, wasn't well, you're at nine. Maybe I'm just not putting it across right, so I'm going to see if I can do a little better job. But it's a desire. There's a desire in your heart for this inner birth, and it's a desire that is unstoppable, that cannot be, cannot be lessened, cannot be uh, repressed. You can't repress it. It's the, like I always say, it's like when you get that present through Amazon and you got to return it, you can never get it back in the box. You can never get all the pieces back. They're, you're never going to undo it. You know, there was a wonderful story about, it's a troubling story, about Graham Greene, who was the author of many great novels, and he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. How many people read Graham Greene? Wonderful novelist. But he was a Catholic, and he had waited two years, because that's how long even a celebrity like him had to wait after he won this award, to meet with Padre Pio, the great Saint Pio, the great master and mystic and, and great spiritual being. And so... Uh, Graham Greene, finally, the two years were up, he was there waiting, waiting for his 
turn, his appointment for just a half an hour to be in the presence. And people said that if you met with Padre Pio, your life would never go back. It would never be the same. He'd touch your soul in a way that you would never return to your old self. But when Padre Pio came out to get him, Graham Greene was gone. And they asked him later, why, why didn't you stay? And he said, I was afraid that I'd lose the comfortable life that I have. Where in you, you're going to lose the comfortable life that you have. You have to desire. You've got to be willing to face that which comes up in order for the birth to take place. I frequently talk about these three steps. What do I want? What's in the way? And what am I doing with it? And these are the three steps that are necessary for the birth to take place, but it all starts with a desire of your whole heart, your whole being, the desire that Mary must have had to go through all of this. All of this. But she said, my soul magnifies the Lord. I'm the humble maidservant. I'm ready. I'm willing. Let it be done unto me as you have said. It's that part of you that wants to say, yes, I'm willing to go through this. I'm willing to learn what is this world and why are you here? Why is your life the way it is? Your life is here as an incubator to birth this new birth. And we say, well, I don't like that incubator. I don't like the way it looks. I don't like the world the way it is. But you know what? The, that egg's going to hatch. That baby's going to be born. You can't stop it. It's going forth. It's perfect because the world is designed not to always make you comfortable, but to allow for a birth. And so... You have to desire it. You have to desire it so much that you can push through that second phase, which is what's in the way. And what's in the way? It's that desire to keep everything the same, the complacency, and that you can never stay the same, and that never will bring you joy. What's the only thing that will bring you joy? What's the only lasting happiness in your heart and your, in your soul? It's when you embrace your whole being, when you embrace your growth, when you embrace your change. I love it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. Together, change. I love it. Bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. Oh, yes. And, and embracing this, that's what this Christmas is about. That's why you have had all these Christmases. That's why the lights and the tinsel and the fun. We decorated this week and had so much fun. And, and those lights, they flash on and off. And we have so much fun because it is so vibrant. But you've got to desire the holy birth in you with the vibrancy, the vibration, the energy, the childlike enthusiasm and wonder of Christmas. Who are the people who have the greatest wonderful experiences at Christmas time? <coughs> children. Who are the second greatest people around children? And who are the third greatest people who don't care what anybody else thinks they act like children? <laughs> You've got to let that out. This is about lightening up and letting go and moving into your Christ consciousness in each and every now moment. That's my meditation for the last couple of months. I lighten up, I let go of personal control, and I move into my Christ consciousness in each and every now moment. But it requires a willingness to allow that Christ consciousness to turn things on its head. You know, just a few days after Jesus was born, his parents took him into the temple in Jerusalem to be blessed. And we often don't hear about this story, but there were two wonderful elderly masters. You know the most enlightened people are usually not the people who write the books or you hear about. They're hidden, they're secret. And these were two masters, Anna and Simeon. And they were up in years. And they said, oh, now that I've seen him, now I can die in peace. But beforehand they each blessed him. And this is what Simeon said, and it's very interesting. He said, this child, he's talking to Mary, is destined to cause many to rise and fall in Israel. He's going to set up a standard that many will attack, for he will expose the secret thoughts of many hearts. And as for you, Mary, your very soul will be pierced as if by a sword. <laughs> what is that sword? It's that sword of love and truth that wants to come in and open your heart. Pierce your heart, your soul. And it's a good thing. It sounds terrible, and your ego doesn't like it, but it's wonderful. You know, sometimes when, when you want to grow, you've got to turn things around. You've got to be willing that what was on top go underneath. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. All of these things. This is essence of Jesus' teachings. And one time, one time I got to see this. 
And you may have heard of the, the sacred clowns in, uh, in the uh, Native American tribes. When I, in 1978, I was driving through Arizona, and I was driving down some country roads, and there were some people pulled over, and I was thirsty, and there were, they were selling uh, something to drink, so I pulled over, and a guy was sitting at a table. And uh, he was a, a member of the Hopi tribe, and he said, oh, he knew, of course, I was a tourist, and he said, oh, right now, in 10 minutes, they're going to have the sacred corn dance. It's only once a year. You can go up there. Talk about a divine appointment. And I, I, walked, I climbed up the ancient steps that had been, had been cut into that side of that mesa uh, a thousand years ago. And I got to the very top, and there was a whole plaza of people. And they, the dances, the chanting, it was otherworldly. No one could have told me there could be anything on this planet that was so completely other than anything I'd ever seen. But the most amazing thing was what happened between the dances. They had the sacred clowns. Have you heard of the sacred clowns? And the sacred clowns are, are not dressed up exactly like our clowns, but you could tell they were sacred clowns, first of all, because everybody was laughing, but also everything they did was backwards. Everything they did was backwards. They turned everything upside down. And the theory of this, their understanding spiritually was that, that in order to grow spiritually, in order to, to be in the flow of life, you've got to be willing to turn everything upside down. And so they embraced the sacred clowns and turned everything upside down. And I remembered that a few years later, when I was, it was about 34 years ago, when I was going... To, through a period where I needed to make a very momentous decision in my life. And I prayed and I just remembered the sacred clowns and I got, go out of town and do everything different than you've ever done. Like just backwards from who you think you are. And so I, I said, okay. So I, it was a Friday, so I found a guest speaker for Sunday service. And uh, they didn't like that too much, but I followed my guidance. And I went driving, and it was in Southern California. The first place I stopped was a hot springs. I'd never taken a hot springs mineral bath. I did. It was wonderful. And then they had a, a, a massage. I never had a massage, so I had a massage. And then I drove over the hill into a, a valley filled with orange blossoms. I'm talking thousands of trees. The smell was like nothing I'd ever had smelled before or since. I stayed there for two days just to experience that. But the experience of it was so, so overwhelming. And then somebody told me about a country and western bar where I could learn the Texas two-step. I was totally out of my comfort zone. Let me tell you, I wouldn't even tell you all the stuff that I saw on the walls of that place. But I, I did that. And the next morning I'm driving along and I see a sign saying Liberal Catholic Church. Yeah. I knew those are theosophists. They weren't the Roman Catholics. These are the people who are very much metaphysical. So I went in and I experienced it was very much a mass and I had the the, the, the communion, I'd never had that before or since, and it was an experience that was wonderful, I, I, I appreciated that, and then I, I got on the road, and I'm driving along, and I'm ready to make my decision, and I, I go to some little farm town, and a big sign says, Buffalo Burgers. I never eaten buffalo, so I thought, okay, buffalo, I'm going to go and eat buffalo. So I ate buffalo, and then I found out they had a motel out back, made of cinder blocks. And I got a little cinder block motel room, and uh, it was clean, that's all he can say for it. And I sat there by the side of my bed, and I said, okay, God, what should I do? And I got, do whatever you want to do, just don't whine about it. And that was the answer. <laughs> now, so that was it, and I did, and it turned out well. So I'm telling you this. It's fun, but it's also, be willing to eat everything that you think. Turn it on your head. If you think, oh, this is who I am, this is what I'm comfortable with, this is my routine, be the sacred clown. Turn the things on your head. Try something different. Go against the grain. You know the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the artist's way, Julie, Julia Cameron, when you're writing with your left hand, if you're right-handed, or, or turning it upside down and doing your painting. Do something to get yourself out of your comfort zone. Do something to get yourself out of your complacency. I do something to get myself out of my comfort zone. Together, I do something to get myself out of my comfort zone. I do the thing that gets me out of my complacency. Together, I do the thing that gets me out of my complacency. And so, and so it's Christmas. And so we're gathering this energy together. And so we're taking it in and we're gathering it and we're going to use it to move us and to be that sacred clown and to turn things upside down and to do, as Simeon said, exposing the secret thoughts of many hearts, 
turning things up upside down, causing many to rise and fall. What Mary said about turning things over in a new way and not living according to what? Materialism. Moving out of materialism. And you know, so interesting, some of the best investors are unity people, like uh, 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 Sir John Templeton. He, he tied the three of my churches that I've been in. Uh, he, he's passed recently, but the Templeton funds. And he once said that the world will tell you that if you have ten apples and you give away nine, you end up with one. Well, I'm telling you, spiritual principle says that if you have ten apples, you give away all ten, you get a thousand. Okay. <laughs> and he says there's, there's, there's no one who will not do better in their business life or their financial life and, uh, uh, than if they didn't use spiritual principles. If you practice them, then they become a part of you. So this is this is a part of us. What about what about what what other revolutionary thoughts and ideas did Jesus bring to us? How about forgiveness instead of resentment? Is there somebody this Christmas season? The energy's here. The love is here. You can you can decide I'm gonna lay down that resentment. You don't have to pretend like it's not there. You can journal it out, you can release it, but you just have to be willing to go through the process and lay down the burden and to move forward. There's so many things that he brought. Everything that the world thought, he said something different. Because he came to overturn the established order, not just in the outer world, but primarily in our inner thoughts, in our inner hearts. So, let's gather this energy together and gather up Christmas. <clears throat> gather up the Christmas that's all around us in this building. Gather up the Christmas that's all around us in society, in the world around us that we've been experiencing, that we've seen in the mall or in the stores. Gather up the Christmas of the years past when you were a little child and all you knew was wonder. Gather that Christmas. Gather the Christmas of all who have ever celebrated this new possibility, this new something that wants to be born in you to push out into expression. Gather it up for forgiveness. <coughs> Gather it up for healing. Gather it up for a change of heart, for a, a spiritual awakening and for abundance. But first you have to want it. Desire it. Desire it now. Generate that desire. I want Christmas. I want Christmas. I want the birth. I want Christmas. I'm like Mary. I don't believe any of this is going to limit me. I am like Mary. My soul magnifies the Lord. I am willing to use everything to forward my growth to be born this Christmas. Thank you, God. And so it is. This is our Christ awakening in each and every now moment. Move into this now moment. Breathe in slowly. Hold your breath as long as you feel comfortable and let it out slowly. And remember that what happened 2,000 years ago wasn't something that just happened to Jesus through Mary. It's something that's happening in, through, and as each one of us right now. And so we move into our Christ birth. There's a wonderful awakening that's awaiting each one of us right now. But we've got to want it. We have to desire it. We have to want it as badly as Mary wanted to give birth. We have to want it as much as the angels wanted to sing forth, or the shepherds wanted to witness the birth. We have to be willing to open ourselves to that desire of the whole universe of love and wisdom and hope and peace to 
be born in our experience. It's no accident that we celebrate the birth of an innocent baby. There's an innocent heart in you. That inner child, that inner innocence desires to come into your awareness and overturn all of your complacency, all of the things that you thought were so important, and replace it with something that's warm and nurturing and real and meaningful. Oh God, I want a life, a new life that has purpose and meaning. Thank you, thank you, God. I desire with my whole heart, my whole being, this awakening, this birth that is an experience, not just a belief, a present truth and reality, not just something I hear about. I desire this birth with my whole self. I give myself into Christmas. I give myself over. To this Christmas experience, gathering up all the Christmases I've ever experienced as a child, the Santa, the Rudolph, the elves, the presence, the wonder. As a more mature adult, the, the holy family, the inner Christ birth, I want all of this now to come together for me in this now moment so that I can awaken. Thank you, God, for my inner Christ awakening in this now moment. I generate my desire. I open my heart. I want the revolution of my heart that overthrows materialism and replaces it with love and generosity, that overthrows resentment and replaces it with peace and forgiveness that overthrows the complacent ideas and replaces it with the experience of this now moment. I want to fall in love with this new idea and give my whole self to it. And I take a moment to make my deep inner commitment to the birth that baby, that Christ in my heart, this Christmas. I gather the energy of all Christmases past, not only for me, but all humankind, and that universal spirit of the desire for a birth, an awakening, a, a new something that wants to come out into expression through each one of us, through me. This isn't for everybody else, this is for me. I claim it for all humanity, but I must claim it. And I'm willing and I'm open and I embrace and I let go into Christmas. Thank you, thank you, dear God. And so it is.
And now it's our time of our offering, and we bless our offering with the thought, I give in the spirit of Christmas love, and I receive abundantly. Together, I give in the spirit of Christmas love, and I receive abundantly. And silently. And again aloud together. I give in the spirit of Christmas love, and I receive abundantly. And so it is. Amen. <laughs> 